Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, and I'll be your host for tonight's conversation. Traditionally, we all get together at industry meetings and events around the world, and though the talks and educational sessions are important and informative, the place where we learn the most, the place where we solve life's greatest mysteries, well, that's around our favorite table with a few friends at the local pub, where we jot down our inspired ideas on the back of a cocktail napkin, and that's the environment that we would like to create here tonight at the Real Science Exchange. <clears throat> Even though that's not possible in today's environment, we are able to get together virtually like this while sharing a virtual drink, or not so virtual, perhaps. Um, for today's episode, my co-host is Dr. Eric Altum. Eric has worked for several international pet and animal nutrition companies in his career and is currently technical nutritionist for Balchem's monogastric segments. Eric, welcome to the Real Science Exchange. Now, Eric's usually our designated driver, and I think I know what's in his glass, but I'm going to go ahead and ask anyway, Eric. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Scott. Uh, great to be here. Um, so unlike the British, where there's only tea is proper in the afternoon, being raised in the South, uh, Iced tea, regardless of the day or night, is always appropriate. So um, that's what I'm having is, is it uh, sweet good. Tea? It is absolutely sweet <laughs> tea. If you show me unsweetened tea, I'll show you a job that's been half done. So uh, <laughs> it, it is sweet tea. It is dark. It is rich. Um, so, yes, I'll be up for some time. All right. Very well. Eric, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Just kind of just a brief overview since it's the first time for you here at the exchange and tell us something that's a little personal, right? Uh, we, we, we say that we'd like to get to know the scientists that uh, visit the exchange in, in a, a different, more personal way. So tell us something that maybe uh, not everybody knows about you. Sure. Um, my classical training is in animal science and in production animal science. I took those skills and have been very lucky over the last several years and a couple of decades to apply those into the companion animal and lifestyle animal arena. So dogs and cats, horses, uh, and other, other species that we share our life with, uh, as far as my personal standpoint, um, I'm very, very lucky. Uh, I've been married to a wonderful lady for about 28 years with two sons. And so we run a man to man defense and, and have done that our entire life. And then we also share um, our home with Labrador retrievers. So we've had competitive Labrador for many years, and we do have one highly motivated English cocker um, by the name of Bo Jackson. Uh, <laughs> excellent, excellent. So tonight's conversation is gonna focus around African swine fever with our guests, Dr. Scott D. and Dr. Gordon Spronk. Both are currently employed by Pipestone Holdings. It's an international uh, production group that has evolved over the years to include production-driven research, nutrition management, animal health, record keeping, keeping, and marketing yeah. services, all designed to support the family farmer. They work with animals around the world and were actually on the ground in China during the early stages of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And we'll be looking forward to hearing more about that in a moment. Uh, Dr. D is a past guest to the Real Science Lecture Series. Your voice may be a little familiar to some of our guests. Now, I've noticed that uh, your drink order has arrived and uh, kind of got the background information on that. Would you mind uh, sharing with us what you're drinking tonight? Yes, well, it's just wonderful to be involved in this. I enjoyed the lecture a week or so ago, and this is a great concept here. I love it. Uh, for this evening, I've selected uh, Amaroni Tomasi Vella Bocella, a nice red wine from Italy that uh, I've been a fan of for many, many years. So that's on that's on the on the docket for tonight. So thank you very much for that. And the true confessions, uh, I've, I've got to drink myself, but uh, the true confessions is, is that I'm drinking a rather inexpensive uh, bourbon. I, I, I traditionally like relatively nice bourbons and scotches, um, but they can be quite expensive. And so uh, was going down the aisle this past week, I saw one in a, in a nice large bottle. It is plastic <laughs> and called early times. And, and, I had a boss, my second uh, job out of uh, college, uh, his name was uh, Ed Noe, 
Um, and he was, he's a Clemson grad. Anyway, he drank early times. And when I saw that, I was like, man, I got, I got to try some of that. And, and honestly, it's not that, uh, it's not that expensive, but it, it's pretty good for the price. So I, I can re recommend it on, uh, on those grounds. So, um, uh, before we get started here, um, Dr. D, I see you brought a, a guest with you. Would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about him? Yes, I'm honored to introduce one of my best friends in the world. Uh, he's actually almost a big brother to me. And that's Dr. Gordon Spronk. He and I have known each other for decades. He's a chairman of the board of Pipestone Holdings. He started the Pipestone system, which you'll probably comment a bit about. We talked about it a little bit at the seminar, but you don't get any better than Gordon. He's a highly intelligent, highly loyal, wonderful friend, very astute, great on the farm, great educator, loves to teach uh, farm personnel, students, uh, even veterinarians and the government. He teaches the government a few things too. So he's got tremendous skills. He's won many awards and it's just a real honor for me to introduce him, and I thought he'd be a perfect uh, mix for uh, for me today. So I think uh, the audience will see that we think a lot alike, but we're we complement each other quite a bit. So um, I could talk for many <laughs> almost an hour about Gordon, but I know uh, we got to move on. So there's a little bit about my friend Gordon Spronk. I got to tell you too, Doctor D, that uh, I've only known you for a month or so. I, had, I failed to mention it earlier, but you've got to be one of the nicest guys I've ever virtually met, yeah. anyway. And so, looking forward Thank to you. someday uh, meeting you in person. Thank uh, you. Yeah, you're quite welcome, Doctor Sprong. Before we uh, move into our discussions on uh, African swine fever, uh, we heard that you were basically at ground zero for the coronavirus. Uh, what was it like during those early days? Um, before it was a global pandemic. Yeah, well, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Eric. And, uh, you know, when I get introduced like that, I, I think your life flashes before your eyes, right? So thank you for the kind words, Dr. D. D Scott, uh, not only is a mentor in life and in science, but he also, he's the guy that turned me on to Amarone. And so uh, he's responsible for that. Thank you. And um, Prego. Uh, very, yeah, Prego, yeah. Prego. Very nice. Uh, to be joining the group tonight. So, you know, well, I'd, if I could, it's not only COVID, but it's uh, ASF. And the two discussions intermingle because in regards to ASF, that was announced in China in August of 2018. We saw it on our farms. We, if you ask a personal question, well, maybe I'm maybe one of the few people that's actually seen ASF in China in a large commercial operation other than a Chinese uh, national. Right. So in addition, in, in regards to COVID, uh, our team has been to China over 500 times. I think I've personally traveled to China over 100 times. I was last there in January. Uh, so if you get the timelines right, announced in August of 18 doesn't really, you know, well, that's ASF. See, this is how I confuse it, right? COVID's really, they, I think they tracked it in, Scott helped me out, uh, late 2019. Mm -hmm. yep. They think it was reported uh, or discovered maybe December in Wuhan. And so, gosh, in late 19, I was in, I was, I was, close to Wuhan, but not quite in Wuhan, but I was in Shanghai and uh, other areas in early 2020 and haven't been back. Uh, basically, I was in uh, China in January. I was in uh, India in February and I was in uh, Paris in March. Each time the virus was sort of following you that they would ask you as you entered, to, you're, you're crossing the international border. Well, when's the last time you were in China well, or some other country? Well, you, I was always 10 days just inside the limit and so i was able to travel but that suddenly uh come to a screeching halt so i personally as, as an aside, i think i was exposed in december and january i think i had you know if, as you go back now the flu-like symptoms of some upper respiratory issue um our farms it, you know it's very interesting on our farms not one positive on a farm yet in china we have over 300 staff not one packing plant is closed in China, and we've had many packing plant closures in the United States. Um, we're not aware of, well, in, you know, I just talked to our staff today. I was on online with them, and 
China just finished testing. They had one, I forget the name, you can Google it, I forget the name of the city, but they just tested 12 million people, a city of 12 million people over a five day period and found two positives. Now only in China would you be able to do that. Two positives? Yeah, out of 12 million. Jeez, <laughs> holy cow. Yeah, and what's interesting, what I really find interesting now is, is on China farms, and this is what, what's germane to our, or what's in focus for our discussion today, is that we've changed the number of biosecurity issues. So the difference between China production and North American production in China, everybody's, every, every site has a dorm, every site has two walls. So we've added biosecurity. We've moved our kitchen, every site has a kitchen, so we moved the kitchen off site. Now people, uh, when staff, and so the normal work routine for a China staff is three weeks on and one week go to home. Well, now when they come back, they have to be put in the local village and put in the, in the hotel room and they're quarantined for 24 hours, so to speak. But what's interesting is, is guess what they test them for before that staff can go back to the farm? They test them for ASF and PED, not COVID. Really? <laughs> so you can't make that up. You can't make it up. Make it up. You, you can't make it up. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, now that's what you learned at the bar, uh, Scott. <laughs> now, this, just checking my listening here. So, so can humans then trans, transmit a PED and uh, ASF? Well, it turns out, well, my, vi my virologist friend should comment. I'm just, this is why, it, and can, can we come back to that question? But I think we need to give our listeners a little bit of background with the uh, Poncho and Lefty show here, right? Uh, <laughs> there's actually a Harvard study out that says the transmission of information and knowledge goes much quicker with physical proximity, which is a little bit of the problem right now with COVID that we're all remote, right? but we have technologies, but so, yeah. I mean, they actually did a study, you can look it up, where the closer two experts in a field are to each other, you know, just geographically, or, you know, just distance-wise, office-wise, the quicker the transmission of information. Well, uh, Dr. D and I can vouch for that, because one day, and we, we happen to have, I share an office. Uh, Scott introduced me as chairman of the board. Well, I share an office with Scott because that's just the way we do it in Pipestone. We we are tight on office space. And I said, yeah, Scott should move in with me. So we literally are five feet apart. Mm -hmm. Well, I, one day during the PED crisis, I come back and say, you know, Scott, you should really go back to Randy's feed mill because do you realize, and this is when PED was in, introduced, do you realize we're, we've got products from Asia you know, most common sense people would say, gosh, it's six months or from the time of the board on date to the time it's actually in the feed is a long time. I said, Scott, you should check that out because I, I think it's a lot shorter than, you know, I, I think we've got a risk here. I, I think you better. And so their launches, Dr. D's, see, this is the beauty of a, a, a field practitioner making an observation and saying, you know, this virus is moving around different than, it, than most viruses. Right. And then Scott actually applying to science. So maybe Scott, yeah. you can comment. I've gone on way too long. No, it's perfect. You know, I remember that day like it was yesterday and you and I went to your brother's feed mill and you pointed this bag of choline out to me. And there it was sitting with a born on date of two weeks of the, of the date we were there. You know, so it's already on the farm in two weeks. Going into the feed. Uh, going into the feed, uh, yeah. And we're all trying to find out how PED got into the United States and I guess I just went bingo. There's got to be a link here. And that's how we started at Pipestone, this transboundary model uh, scientific evaluation that's been published for PD, but also African swine fever, pseudo rabies, classical swine fever. This model that simulates movement of products from Asia or Eastern Europe to the US. But I wouldn't have had a clue about that unless if I had not gone to <laughs> on the farm put on my boots, go on in the mill, Gordon points it out, and wow, that opened the whole door. It was like a whole new door got opened up before me, and I just saw opportunity for experimentation beyond belief. So that's exactly, that's a great example for that study you quoted, Gordon. I read that study, you gave me that study. And yeah, the closer you are, the, the more you can exchange. So that's a great story. I love that story. Talking a little bit about, uh the research that you did to embark on after that, right? Yeah, you know, um, again, 
we started thinking about how could we model movement of product, because obviously that's a whole can of worms, but could we do it experimentally? And I started working with uh, some colleagues of mine at South Dakota State University, Dr. Eric Nelson and Dr. Diego DL. And I had this idea about, can we take products we import, spike them with PED, put them in a chamber that would simulate the environmental conditions over land and sea, and do it for a period of time that mimics a true transoceanic journey. And we all sat down, we had put that together, and it worked. It showed that uh, PED virus could survive in, I think it was five or out of 10 or 14 ingredients that we studied, one of them being soy. And that was the first published proof of concept that this virus could potentially live across the ocean, which had, had was like a black box. No one ever had any idea whether that was true or not. So then mm -hmm. that just led to me working with Megan Niederwerder with the actual African swine fever virus at Kansas State using the model again. So the model that started out with Gordon's observation is the Brothers Feed Mill has brought a whole bunch of cool information into the discussion today. Some actual scientific data that says, you know, this could happen. So that's kind of, it's, it's a great story. What most people don't realize is the ability of, of field observation combined with science and the power of that. In other words, our operations in the U.S. watching PED move around, our operations in Asia watching PED move around, then our op observations in Asia watching ASF move around. There's power in the observation then connected with the science. So it's not just Scott having some science that he answered a call for a research paper. No, 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 no. He's backing up field observations. I think that's, that's right. Oh, yeah. if, that's, if that's valuable to your listeners, they should know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, here's what I'm seeing. Tell me why. They tell yeah. me why these viruses are moving around and we can't, we can't figure it out. You know, I, what I'm seeing is real. Exactly. And now we got to figure out why it's real. We know viruses moving from farm to farm with PED in North America back in, mm -hmm. gosh, Scott, 2016? Mm -hmm. Oh, 2013, 2014. 13. 13. So yeah. then that PED, and there's a lot of history there, field observations where Scott went immediately out and isolated virus. So that there, there's a there's foundational building blocks here that are very key for the astute listener to understand that you've got field observation backed up with data. Yeah. Yeah. But I think one of the important things to remember is I was a practitioner myself. I was a practitioner for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the university, I continued to go to farms. I would often go to Pipestone. So I would stay connected. And so I had that understanding of field, the importance of field observations and kind of raising what question do we want to answer? from those field observations. And so I'm kind of a hybrid of a practitioner plus a scientist, which has been very yeah. helpful for me to kind of talk the languages and yeah. talk with somebody like Gordon and kind of see where he's coming from and then try to design a study that uh, that will answer his question. Yeah, and that's so important. The field observation, you know, I could be wrong, right? I could be making an observation and leaping to the wrong conclusion. Scott is very disciplined and his skill really is figure out well, what's the right question? What's the right hypothesis? Without the right question, my observations really don't mean a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And then take that question and then prove or disprove the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. That's the hard science. So Scott brings such good discipline from a hard, his training of hard science and applying it to field the field application Gosh, that's been invaluable to our farms, whether it's been on PERS, whether it's PED, now in African swine fever. The value proposition is very, very easy to calculate on the ability. If you can keep disease out of your farms, in, in North America, it was historically PERS. There's a long history of filtration on how that happened. Now in, Af in Asia, it's keep ASF out of your farms because even though today I, I was on, on a call with our staff. Uh, Wean pigs today are still 100, and I think there's 800 RMB. So do the math. It's 110 dollars, something, maybe 115 dollars per weaned pig. 
your profitability per weaned pig, a six kg pig, is maybe sixty to seventy dollars. <laughs> that that was as high as two hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah so literally a the gold yeah. rush in China has been for the last twelve to eighteen months. Mm -hmm. Well, that gold rush is even more valuable if you've struck the mother load of keeping ASF out of your farms. Mm -hmm. And so Scott's done a nice job of documenting how you do that in addition to uh, the feed, the whole portfolio of biosecurity on a cell phone. That's worth real money. Yeah, and the feed, you know, we didn't have a plan for feed, Gordon, because we didn't no. know that it ever was a well, risk factor. When PED came to North America, we were told viruses do, are not transmitted in feed. You have to start yep. there. Everybody said common common knowledge was no no viruses are ever been documented transmitted in feed. Now look look at the data that Dr. D has. Yep. Yeah, there's a stack of publications now between Pipestone, uh, Kansas State, South Dakota State, Iowa State, UM. Right. It's just a growing body of evidence, as they used to say. I guess for Richard Nixon's perspective yeah, on things. The growing, so. Well, people accuse Pipestone of why do you keep pounding on this uh, feed issue? Well, it's because we see the field observation. Mm -hmm. So speaking of uh, field observations, you're, you've not seen ASF here and you've not observed it here in the States, but you have in China. What can you tell us about it there? What, what have you seen and what has led to some of your assumptions and research there with, with ASF? Well, it's, it's the world's worst Fire swine virus in the world's largest swine herd. Mm. I'll repeat that to make sure that sinks yeah. in with your listeners. ASF is the world's worst swine virus in the world's 56% of all pigs are in China. That's the game changer. That's sort of on the graph. You know, you always see the, the inflection point. Well, that's China, ASF in China. And so you see mortality. The, all the clinical signs are there. The issue that's really that everybody, the unfocused uh, uh, observer needs to be aware of, this is a virus been around for a long time, been in Africa. And again, Dr. D is the virologist. I'll speak as a practitioner. I'll let him speak as the virologist. Been in Africa a long time, makes its way to the Iberian Peninsula. Actually, Spain er eliminates this virus uh, in the 60s and 70s. Then it makes its way into uh, up into Poland and Russia, then makes its way across Russia now enters from Russia into China, we think. And, you know, if, if you let it go its normal course, it, it's 100% mortality. The, all the pigs die. Mm. And there is really no effective vaccine. Now, vaccines are in rampant use in China. None of it's approved, but everybody uses it. It's That's just the culture, right? I, and again, I'm not making any, I'm not making a judgment right or wrong. I'm just saying that's, what's happening in China. Mm -hmm. And so that's way different than the history of this virus has been as soon as a population was in, was infected with it, the herd was depopulated. So depopulation was the intervention of choice. Well, that's not occurring in China right now. They're using a, what I would call a live with it approach. And the live with it approach is if I get into my sow herd, they would apply what we would refer to as a fairly sophisticated test and removal program. They'd find the positive sow, they would remove that sow and then test around that sow. Now that's possible with, with really three or four tools. Well, the first tool is they all have on-site PCR labs, which I'm not aware of anybody in North America with a, a farm with a PCR lab on, right, right. On, on the farm, but every farm there has a PCR lab. Second, they, uh, they're very, uh, much like COVID, right? We just talked about testing a city of 12 million. Well, they're very good about controlling the whole uh, uh, entrance into the site. They, they've got double walls now. We've got inside trucks, outside trucks. We, we have, a, we, I know some farms with 400 cameras on the, just to control personnel movement. So it, it's, it's a fascinating uh, virus uh, when you see it in this culture. I guess the one thing that just kind of seems uh, significant to me is that you know, because it is so deadly, it's surprising to me that uh, that the virus can t continue to find substrate, right? Uh, yeah. New animals to, to to populate or to to, to infect, and uh, just kind of curious 
it must does it live in animals are there are there um the typhoid marys of the swine industry how's it how's it keep going i'll let dr p come in well it's it's a big dna virus so it's this huge think of it as a big protein sphere like an army tank almost made out of iron and steel mm -hmm. so it's one of the largest viruses we deal with. It's almost as big as pox virus. It's much bigger than PERS, much bigger than PD, influenza. And it's built out of protein with very little lipid. So it means it can survive. It survives everywhere, outside of the pig, in the meat, uh, for years if it's frozen. It's just it's so stable in the environment, it's hard to clean it up. That's been one of the nice things, I think, that uh, Gordon and his team have developed in China is how to clean up facilities that actually it actually works to keep to get the environmental risk out of the farm so you can restock it after you've been forced to eliminate but it's just like a big iron tank just think of it that way it's bump, bullets bouncing off of it uh, as it rolls down the the the, the, the landscape uh, causing trouble one of the questions I had is you know you're talking about cleaning up the farms but then um, I deal a lot with ingredients and feed mills and and manufacturing feeds and and if you heat it up enough, then you kill everything in there. So there's bacteria, viruses, whatever, and that's the belief. And we know that's not exactly what's going on now. So how do we go about? What are some of the techniques if we this gets into a feed mill? You know as well as I do, all the nooks, the crannies, the crevices, um, all of the the, the grain material, the protein material that's there. Uh, how do you how do you get this cleaned up if it's such a big protein that can then be be in these in that environment? That that that's kind of one of the questions that that fascinates me on how how do we handle that? Well, you can. It is it is susceptible to heat. I mean, you have to get up to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. But it, it is susceptible to heat at a very high level. It is susceptible to a high and low pH. So you have to get beyond, say, pH below pH 4 and above pH 11. So it's very okay. stable. Uh, the good news is in feed mills, um, Dr. Niederwerder, Megan Niederwerder, our colleague at KSU, has just published some a paper mm -hmm. that showed the ability of certain uh, additives to the diet that have antiviral properties against ASF. Oh, okay. So good. you could potentially flush the whole mill and the feed line and everything, all the grinders and everything with a mitigated diet and then decontaminate it. We know we know what disinfectants work mm -hmm. against ASF. And so you could you could potentially do it. I mean, it'd be a, it's a lot of work, but we we now have some guidelines that we could use to uh, to make some decisions, what product, how mm -hmm. long how hot, those types of things. None of that really was uh, available uh, just with probably within the last year or so, Gordon. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys, you guys, you guys kind of figured a lot of that out in, in the China yeah. situation and now it's been reproduced scientifically. So yeah, uh, I, it's, it's I, new information. I hear what you're saying and it is a concern, but it turns out, I think in practical field application, if you just follow some basic steps that Scott just talked about, good cleanliness first of all a good a good mill in other words put, put in your mind a good a good mill and they they do exist second you heat in china now oh gosh scott is it 85 c that's yep. nearly everything in china is now 85 c yes which is a little bit over the top but that's just what they're doing and then second they're using an intervention whether it's acidification or whether it's okay. you know so between those three things, just run a good feed mill, a good operationally, which is probably what you should be doing anyway. Right. right. In addition to some interventions, uh, we Scott and I were just on the phone uh, earlier this week with a Chinese uh, colleague. Uh, gosh, Scott, they had nearly 500,000 PCR samples. I think they had two positives here just recently. Okay. And that's all feed mill sampling. Mm -hmm. So yeah. trucks, feed ingredients, operations in the in the feed mill. And so, yes, they had positives, but boy, two out of uh, 500,000 is, is good. Yeah. yeah. And especially when you look back and you, the data we saw, when was it, Gordon? February 2019. Yes. The number of positives was a lot higher. Right. During the acute epidemic that was yeah. happening since September yeah. of 2018. Here we are, February 2019. 
there's pigs dying, there's blood everywhere, you know, there's virus everywhere. Right. So it's, it's really changed, which is a real good thing to see, yeah. the, the percentage yeah. of positive samples going way down. Yeah, so to Scott's point about the early epidemic, right, and it was epidemic, now it's endemic, but the early epidemic, that virus is being moved around everywhere because the, the cultural behavior was once you identified a positive in, let's say, a finishing group, you immediately, the behavior was, you immediately loaded them on the truck and sold them. Well, what you then essentially did was you contaminated the you truck. You just contaminated everything. You right? contaminated the packing plant. You contaminated the meat. You contaminated everything. Well, that was like, again, the world's largest swine herd. That's what was occurring. And so the, in the at the epidemic phase, it was just the virus was everywhere. Mm. Yeah, think of it like a neutron bomb. Yeah, like the bomb mushroom, like mushroom cloud, you know. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. what I think of it when I remember those days when I was still yeah. traveling to China. Yeah. So what's the future look like uh, the next few years, right? I mean, we've, we've seen our experience here with uh, with our coronavirus. When it first got here, it was, it was a neutron bomb, and now we've kind of learned to live with it, and it's kind of – well, I think we have. We're kind of seeing the spike coming on now. But so what, what's that look like for African swine fever, specifically yeah, in China right I, now? I'll let Scott to come in also. But, you know, uh, I, I think it goes, you say China, but I think we should look at it both ways, Scott. One, in North America, our value proposition is to keep it out. Yeah. And we have successfully for yeah. many years, including now since uh, August of 18. Our value is we had we don't have, in our national herd, there's no foot and mouth, there's no hog cholera, there's no... Uh, pseudorabies, there's no ASF. That's the value to American agriculture. In China, what you have to remember, again, culturally, I'm not in any way saying good or bad, yes or no, I'm just saying this is the observation. They have all those viruses. And their intervention of choice is to vaccinate, not eliminate. And so they vaccinate for pseudorabies. They vaccinate for hog cholera. They vaccinate for foot and mouth. They vaccinate for African swine fever now. And that's 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 just the way it's gonna be. Right or wrong, that's, that's their cultural answer. And we have to be aware of that. And so they're gonna struggle, in my opinion, right? You take all those viruses. We know the value of uh, a group of 3,000 pigs at weaning that if they're negative for all those viruses, including being negative for flu, including being negative for mycoplasma, 97 to 98% of those pigs can go to market as tops without any antibiotics. We know that. We have the data for that. Mm -hmm. That's the difference in the value. You talk about sustainability. So the, really the long-term future here is the North American industry will be more sustainable and the Chinese industry will be challenged. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, one of the questions that, that we see quite a bit is um, – this crossover, other species or feral animals, we're seeing that in Germany, uh, Poland, Hungary, Russia as well. So some of the wilder species are carrying it. Um, is that just something that those countries are going to have to live with because they have a natural resource and of, of wild, um, wild swine, boars um, in, in, their, in their programs as well? So obviously that has to have an impact and is a vector for transmission. Huge, huge in, in Europe. Um, I mean, that's a hunting of those wild boars. It's a big deal. It's, it's a big economic advance. So it's, it's worth a lot of money. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll always, I always critique the Europeans and I said, I know the wild boar is important. I clearly believe that's the number one risk factor, but you might be overlooking the risk of feet. So they get so focused on the wild boar, which is true. I mean, it's really important. But I think they might have binocular blinders on. They're not looking at other potential routes to move it around. Mm -hmm. So I challenge the Europeans uh, to look at our data and try to study that. And they've started. They've started to do that. So it's kind of a, like a new, yeah. like it was for us, it's like a new room mm -hmm. that you enter for the first time in your life. Right. Right. Well, and the and, and never forget the not only is it the wild boar population, it's the backyard population. So right. I, I was in Russia. Uh, gosh, Joseph and I, Scott, were there six months ago, and they they have ASF. Russia has ASF in their boar population, and they have 
ASF in their commercial operations. And when they get ASF in their commercial operations, they eliminate, they el immediately eliminate, and the, the structure in the site is shut down for months at a time, six to nine months, it's shut okay. down. Very strict Russian regulations. And Scott's right. In Germany, uh, hunt, hunting boars is a, is a sport of kings. So yeah. you, you, you have to understand that, that, that they're not gonna eliminate wild boars. <laughs> and so that population is just going to circulate. Well, um, that virus is going to circulate in that population. And that population, whether they're hunted or not, is not going to just all of a sudden evaporate. Exactly. It's, it's that, it's, that, it's, anybody that knows anything about wild pigs, it, they multiply. They don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're fast. So, so hunting, no hunting is really not the answer. It's yeah. are they going to evaporate and then they're moving. And I like what yeah. Dr. D said, because that made me think about it. There's a lot of other things out there moving in the environment. They could be moving this around on their on their feet as well yeah. through those environments, and um, yeah. and that could be a challenge. Well, I think what it's also important for the audience to understand is is the difference between a, a the the regulatory impact of certain viruses. So, case in point, PED. When PED enters the United the North American swine herd, no, there was no regulatory impact, none. We could move our pigs, we could move our our animals, we could go to market, we could move our meat. Well, if African swine fever enters the North American herd, that's a way different situation. Mm. Now, one could argue that the uh, impact is so economically devastating that we should just change the status of ASF. Now, for again, we're having wine so we can have these discussions over, over, uh, over a friendly beverage. And so additionally, make sure that you understand that today, Poland has African swine fever in their wild population, and they still export meat, including to the United States. Mm. And Germany will be lobbying for the same impact. Germany will use, under the OIE, they'll use what they call regionalization, and within regionalization, they'll use zoning. So if there's, there's positive areas, well then anything within that zone uh, can not move, or not those pigs can't go to slaughter, nor then can they be exported. Right. Well, so if you look at the big picture of things, isn't it ironic that uh, Germany now has been banned from shipping pork to China, <laughs> to China. because of ASF, and China is infected with ASF? Well, <laughs> that doesn't pass the common sense test, does it? No, uh, I, no, that doesn't. No. <laughs> no. So you need you, make it up. you need common sense, you need discernment, and you need some sense of wisdom, right? Well, that one doesn't even pass the common sense test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, Doctor Spong, before you were talking about that, so it's it's not here in North America. I've been talking way too much about this way, Scott. So I'll shut up. <laughs> it's no, it's great. Keep her going. Um, so it's not in the U.S. Um, if it gets here, how does it get here? What's 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 the uh, what's the route? Well, you're strictly speculating. Yeah, right? of course. You're, That's the fun part. Yeah, this is this is pure speculation. So, like PED. We speculate it came in from a Asian uh, feed source of something. You know, it could have been, it could have been something that's, uh, you know, uh, that was imported for dog food. Somehow ended up in the in the in the swine. Uh, could, could have been. We, you know, you, you don't. You don't know. You're never going to find a smoking gun, but you can make some pretty good guesses, right? You can make some pretty good guesses. African swine fever. If it was going to enter, somebody would import infected meat. You know, they'd either do it legally or illegally. That's when you saw the, gosh, how many million pounds in, in New York. They caught it in the harbor there. That, uh, you know, everything was labeled one thing, but it was really another thing. That, you know, so it'd be a, a massive illegal import would be route number one. But remember that that meat then has to, it has to go to the restaurant. And then from the restaurant, it has to be discarded and then get into a pig population. And that's why we have regulations about all uh, waste food has to be cooked, has to be, you know, uh, reach a certain temperature. And so there'd be a number of breaches along the whole thing. So, for instance, all airlines that come in, if they uh, uh, confiscate any material from grandma, you know, taking her favorite Chinese uncooked dish and they confiscate that material, well, that's got to be the Customs and Border has to that has to be burned on site. So there'd have to be a breach in that protocol. Somehow, Graham would have to get through, right? That she, the meat actually made it, and whoever she she went to, well, then the scraps from the table would have to get into the pig population. 
That's yeah. how it could enter. So more so than just uh, feed ingredient type products coming in. What, more so. It, 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 oh, yeah. it could either be feed, yes, or it'd be what we call refer to stupid human tricks. Okay. Yeah. Now, if it yeah. were on feed, what, what, what type products? I think I've, I recall your PED uh, research. It was most prevalent in soybean meal. Um, is, is that the case with uh, African swine fever as well? You know, that's been so reproducible by so many people and across so many viruses, it's almost scary. So Pipestone, South Dakota State, Kansas State, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Gordon, need a refill. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for a friend. There we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Can I phone a friend? <laughs> a, a virtual pour. How about a virtual pour? But, yeah, soybean meal for some reason, be it plant protein, uh, high protein, low fat. It's amazingly protective. I mean, you look at the list that's been published. PED survives. African swine fever survives. Pseudorabies, foot and mouth disease. That hasn't been published, but there's a project going on right now at Plum Island that's showing the same thing. Hog cholera, Seneca virus, which is a cousin to foot and mouth, and many other viruses. Soy is something weird about soy. And that's it. The challenge with soy is it's a bulk ingredient of huge proportions. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to take some bags of choline or vitamins here and there and put them through a responsible imports protocol and, and uh, reduce the risk because pr the processing is so good. Soy is a whole different can of worms because you think about it, you get all this bulk and you got a little hot spot, a virus somewhere in that bulk. And how in the world do you, one, you'll never find it. Two, you'll never inactivate it because to get your inactivation throughout that big bulk would be really challenging. However, you're going to mitigate that. So mm -hmm. if I had to pick one thing that we should stop bringing into the United States, it would be soy based materials from ASF positive countries. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so reproducible. It's amazing how easy it is to show these viruses I've just talked about surviving in soy. It's weird. And nobody seems to know why, but it's there. So if I had one wish, I would say no more, no more soy based products from ASF positive countries to the U S I'd sleep better at night. Yeah. Are we currently bringing in a lot of uh, soybean meal from positive countries? Oh yeah. We we are. It's a small amount compared to what we export, of course, but uh, I think in 2018 we brought in 104,000 metric tons from uh, ASF positive countries. I think in 2019 it went down quite a bit because of all the pressure the industry put on and the, the volume went down. But we're still bringing it in. It's coming under the guise of organic. You know? Yeah, that's what I want. Organic, yeah. right? Quote unquote which is a real laugh, I think, when you think of organic coming from China. And so it's coming in that way. It's going into human food. It's going into animal food. It's very hard to track after it comes into the country. Uh, to me, the, the U.S. soy, we've talked about this, U.S. soy board ought to just start making their own organic meal and just take care of our country's needs uh, locally and domestically rather than bring in this stuff from a positive country with all the data that says if it ever got contaminated, and Gordon's right. There's steps that have to happen. This isn't just a simple deal. Mm. But if it ever happened, if the stars ever all aligned, like I think they did with PED, it, it would it would live very nicely in that medium and, and uh, potentially get on a farm. And then just, you know, all hell would break loose then. Yeah, that, that could that could be just devastating the whole the whole families and everything with all with their entire farms and, and things like that. I, I that's what scares me is that when it gets there, the steps you yeah. have to take to contain it and then try to eradicate it. Um, and yeah. individ the individuals involved, it, it would be, that would be, a, it'd be devastating. Well, I know at the lecture I gave, I, I, I quoted some figures from some economists, 16.5 billion us dollars would be lost the first year. Yeah. That's this year one. So 30% of our pork exports would turn into zero, depressing prices on beef and poultry. It would probably stop a lot of our grain exports, mm -hmm. and it would stop our tourism. You know, you read the literature on when foreign animal diseases come into a new country, like 
England with uh, foot and mouth or Holland with classical swine fever. Nobody wants to go there. So their tourism industry actually gets depressed. And so all that, those dollars are reduced. And as far as I found, the only thing that goes up is the suicide rate. That's oh. the only metric I found that actually goes up during an FAD outbreak in a country is, is uh, the loss of human life just because of all the depression that happens secondary to this. So it's so scary. To me, it's just like a no-brainer. We, we should stop doing this. We can't afford to take our agricultural sector and, and keep rolling the dice just for a hundred and some thousand metric tons. That's a drop in the bucket. First of all, I'm an, I'm an avid podcast listener, and I, so I listen to several podcasts about coronavirus, and and it, it sounds like that um, Asia, specifically China, tends to be the hot spot where there's emerging viruses, uh, whether that's because there's a lot of interface between wild game and humans, and it's starting to spill over into the human population, or, you know, DF deforestation, I'm not really sure. I think it's a little bit of everything. So the question was going to be, are there are there some other emerging viruses that kind of keeping you guys awake at night that you see kind of coming and, and uh, that maybe have you worried? You know, the, the one that comes to mind, this is a great story. It's PERS virus, which, you know, we know a lot about now, but PERS virus showed up in North America and Europe in probably 1987 or 88. And two different, very different viruses, they were related, but they were about 30 to 40% different. Uh, and what was interesting was back in 1981, they were, uh, sorry, I should say in 1990, 1991, they went back to serum banks that were at the University of uh, Montreal, I think, as, and Iowa State, and they looked at serum from pigs all the way back to 1981. And there were antibodies to PERS virus mm. back in the early 80s, but there was no evidence of the disease until almost 10 years later. And so a lot of these viruses are smoldering in the background. They ne didn't necessarily jump from a bat to a hedgehog or whatever the story is on COVID. They've just been in the pig population for a long time and they mutate, and finally the one mutation that takes hold uh, shows up and boom, here all of a sudden we have these there major is. diseases. So it's not just the ones that are people are talking about, it's ones we haven't even thought about. Because mm -hmm. we never thought about PERS until the late 80s. It's, there's stuff going on behind the scenes, we don't have a clue. And it's hard to, it's hard to look that, closely at it and try to predict it so it's kind of a bad answer to your question but it just shows you how difficult some of these viruses are to deal with well i guess the reality is there is no answer right i mean there's yeah. we, we're it just seems like we just need to get the infrastructure in place the science in place that we are prepared for when the next one does come along and and we, we can mobilize quickly whether that's prevention or or, or developing the next uh, vaccine um it uh, goes back to those field observations. You have to have people like Gordon in the field yeah. every day picking up That's on this point. stuff way before it becomes, you know, widespread knowledge. That's where the real value of the practitioner, the astute practitioner who's seen enough that he or she knows that this is a different situation right here. Mm -hmm. And they start asking the questions and taking the samples. So, again, yeah. a tribute to the field. Gentlemen, are there any uh, key issues that we haven't addressed yet uh, related to African swine fever? Uh, the only thing I'd say yeah. is, is I would in, continue to encourage everyone to be a student of the game. Understand that that's a pretty big change that occurred in August of 18, when, again, as we've said before, not to repeat ourselves, but the world's worst swine virus entered the world's largest swine herd. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And Scott, I would, um, you know, our next generation of animal scientists, uh, um, veterinarians, virologists that are coming up, I would, I would request they take a page out of these gentlemen's playbook and try to marry observations and scientific methodology. Um, I agree. That's an incredibly, incredibly powerful tool. Um, get out of the laboratory, get on the farms, get into those types of situations. And, um, and and see what's going on in a day-to-day -day 
Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's how you that's how you really get into some strong problem solving. Those are those are wise words, Eric. And I think what the scientists have to do is you have to respect the field. Well, that doubt. To, you, and a lot of scientists don't respect the field. They you know field observation now nah, it doesn't matter. You know, you have to respect the field, and it's hard. It's uncomfortable sometimes to get out of the lab and get down on the farm. You know, shower in, go through all that stuff. That's not a simple procedure for a lot of these people because they've never right. done it before. Right. You got to respect the field and listen to what they're saying. Or else you're going to miss it big time. Gentlemen, as we wrap up, are there any final take home messages you'd like to leave with the audience? Some, some things that they can, they can begin using immediately uh, to mitigate the, 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 the risk of transmission of ASF. Hmm. Well, the value is all in elimination and, ev- and keeping it out. That's where the value is for North America, especially keeping it out. And if you can help your customers in the American agricultural industry do that, you will you will be adding value. And I would say be a student of the science and be aware of the work that's been done as far as the risk factors for African swine fever. And then translate that to your customer, be it a vet student, be it a farmer, be it another scientist, be it a group of practitioners. Pay attention to the literature and uh, be able to speak in multiple languages so you can make sure the message is understood. Mm -hmm. As we wrap it up here, folks, I want to thank uh, Dr. Spronk and Dr. D for joining us today. You guys have been great guests, a lot of fun, uh, (laughs) very enlightening uh, discussion. I sincerely appreciate everybody stopping by to spend some time with us here tonight at the exchange. If you like what you've heard, please drop us a five star on your way out and hit the subscribe button so you'll continue to receive the alerts for future episodes. Uh, And we'll see you here next time at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour. The conversation is sometimes saucy and you're always among friends. Cheers. Cheers. Salute. Salute. Salute.